Good evening. Welcome to the Euro webinar from the European School of Urology. Um, the topic for the day is the underactive detrusor, the story so far. And, uh, and my name is Jay Castigir. I'm a consultant uh, urologist in Swansea in South Wales. Uh, so welcome to a very cloudy day today. Um, this is not as the pictures show, but this is in the height of summer. So it, as you can see, uh, we have a lovely place. It's my privilege to work and live by the sea in a beautiful part of the country. And it is indeed an honor to invite you all to this webinar. Now, to begin with, I have to say that I have no relevant disclosures and, and that uh, this webinar uh, will comprise of a talk for about 30 minutes or a bit more perhaps, uh, and then that will be followed by another 15, 20 minutes um, time for questions and answers. Now, on your screen, on the software, you should have a little box which should say questions. And towards the end of the talk, please type in your questions and I'd be very happy to answer them for you if I can. Okay, so what are we going to achieve here? Now this, what are we looking at is the, the topic is called uh, the true sound reactivity and it's what we know so far, the story so far. And that's because our knowledge at the moment is quite limited of, of this topic. And this webinar, webinar aims to improve our knowledge of what is a poorly understood condition at the current time. Now, if you do a literature search on this topic, you'll find that there's not a lot of literature published in terms of original research. And, and therefore, it remains poorly researched and poorly understood so far. And yet, it's a very common condition. And therefore, what we hope to achieve today is to summarize what we know to date. But this, of course, you must remember, is in the early days. So we are pretty much in the primitive days of understanding what this condition is. And what we talk about today will probably change quite a lot in the years to come. Okay, now what is an impaired ability to empty the bladder? Now this is common in both men and women and the prevalence of this increases with age. Now when you think about impaired ability to empty, this could be either an impaired ability to generate an efficient bladder contraction or it may be consequent to obstruction at the level of the bladder outlet. And both of these may lead to lower urinary tract symptoms. Voiding dynamics, when you try and understand the physics of how voiding happens, it's determined by the relationship between detrusive force generation and the resistance that it faces. So when we talk about detrusive underactivity, what we're talking about is the decrease in the strength or the duration of detrusive contraction and this prevents timely and efficient emptying of the bladder, okay? Now, the word detrusa originates from the Latin detrudare or detrusi, which I understand means to expel. And it's this expulsion during the voiding phase of the micturition cycle is what we are studying here today, okay? Now, detrusa underactive, un underactivity and the underactive bladder are two terms which are used to describe the urodynamic side of things and the symptomatic side of the same condition. Now, in a way, I'd like to draw an analogy to the way we talk about detrusive overactivity when we do urodynamic studies, and we talk about the overactive bladder as a symptom complex. Now, they may be, from what you might think, that it might be two sides of the same coin, but you must remember that one is a urodynamic observation and the other one is a symptom complex and therefore these terms may not be synonymous. So why should we even worry about this? What, what is the problem here? The first thing to say is that it's very commonly encountered in the clinic even though we don't know how to diagnose it as often and, and as easily as we should. But we have data that suggests that two thirds of the institutionalized elderly have detrusor underactivity and that three quarters or three fourths of elderly women who present with urinary retention have the same condition. Now, if you look at this large, uh, at the Epilux study, which is a large uh, 
uh, epidemiological uh, study of community dwelling uh, people over the age of 40 years. Um, what it reported was that voiding LUTs, storage LUTs, and post maturation LUTs are very common, both in men and women. And it is thought that a good proportion of this is caused by Petrusa underactivity. Although at the moment, determined by the fact that we have, we have uh, difficulties in diagnosing this in the community, uh, it is difficult to determine to what extent that this contributes to the epidemiology. Now, most men with voiding symptoms have diminished flow rates. But what we also know is that a significant proportion of them do not have obstruction on urodynamics. For example, if you look at the EAU guidelines on the management of non-neurogenic LUTs, you'll find the data quoted that a man with a Qmax of less than 10 mils per second will have a positive predictive value of 70% for bladder outlet obstruction. In other words, it's the remaining proportion of men will not be obstructed. And similarly, for less than 15 mils per second, the PPV is 67%. Now, we also know that the finding of an elevated post-void residual volume post-maturation is more indicative of detrusive failure rather than outlet obstruction. And we also know that women who undergo midurethral sling surgery with a low flow rate preoperatively are more likely to fail a trial of void after surgery. So there are implications of what we offer our patients and, and their outcomes. Now, what about data from clinical studies? Now, these studies are urodynamic based, which means that they are a very selected population. These are patients who have been referred for urodynamics. And, in, and, and therefore, this probably underestimates the prevalence of detrusive underactivity. Because, of course, some people would not have been referred for urodynamics in the first place. They might have either decided that their symptoms are not uh, significant enough, not bothersome enough. Or it may be that no intervention or invasive intervention was recommended and therefore urodynamics was academic and not required. But if you look at the data that we have, we find that between 9 and 28% of males under the age of 50 will have detrusive underactivity. And DUA is also present, present in almost up to almost 50% of males over the age of 70. In 12, in, in females, the, the range is between 12 and 45% and more commonly in elderly nursing home residents. This is a table which demonstrates the, uh, the range of studies that have reported on detrusive underactivity based on urodynamic parameters. And, and as you can see, there's a the range of, of um, prevalence figures. Uh, however, all of them suggest that it is a quite a prevalent condition when you do urodynamic studies. There's also another interesting study which uh, demonstrated after 11 year follow up of men who had gone, uh, undergone TURP with detrusive sounder activity versus those who have had no TURP. The men with detrusive sounder activity were found to have no significantly uh, sustained reduction in sim symptoms, no improvement in flow rates, and a higher incidence of chronic retention. If you compare this with people who had TURP with bladder outlet obstruction, the outcomes were significantly poorer. So this is the significance of, of this condition. Now, when you look at the literature, you'll find a lot of different terms that are used to describe it. You know, there could be detrusive areflexia, underactive bladder, detrusive failure, impaired detrusive contractility, detrusive underactivity. All these terms are quite confusing. And, and therefore, it is quite important for us to get a definition which is precise and something that will be easy to both understand and apply to our clinical practice. So the ICS defined this back in 2002 in the standardization document by, by stating that it is, it, it refers to a contraction of reduced strength and or duration resulting in prolonged bladder emptying and or a failure to achieve complete bladder emptying within a normal time span. Now, if you look at a urodynamics trace, you may look at the 
the pressure flow or the voiding phase aspect of it. And you may say, yes, I think that that looks pretty obvious. You can see that the contraction of the PDET, which is the subtracted detrusor pressure, is, is not very well sustained and the amplitude is not very high. So you may think that it's reasonable to, to call that detrusor under activity. However, if you look at the definition, the definition has got serious flaws. First of all, there's no threshold for reducing for reduced strength on, on, on pressure flow studies. We don't know. There's no definition of what is meant by reduced strength. We don't know what prolonged bladder emptying really means in terms of time span. And also, what's a normal time span for, for voiding? Now, the other problem is that when you look at urodynamics and the ways we assess contraction strength to define um, the detrusor the under activity, all the formulae and the algorithms, well, most of them, do not take into account the duration of the contraction. And, and that, again, is something that's in the definition. So the way we diagnose it and what's in the definition has a discrepancy. What about the clinical aspect of this? The clinical diagnosis of detrusor under activity is, is hampered by the need for pressure flow studies. So in other words, um, unless we do pressure flow studies, we can't really tell. And, and we also don't know what exactly the symptoms and signs are for this condition. And, and that's why there is also a lack of awareness of the clinical aspect of this, which, is, which has been called the underactive bladder. So again, definition is very difficult. And this is only a working definition. It's something that is being worked on by the ICS working group. Um, and and, uh, and, and it, the working definition, which is by no means the definitive one, is that the underactive bladder is characterized by a slow urinary stream, hesitancy and straining to void, with or without a feeling of incomplete bladder emptying and dribbling, often with storage symptoms. Now, it should not be taken to imply a specific pathology or etiology, and it is not interchangeable with detrusor under activity, which as I mentioned to you earlier, is a urodynamic observation. But if you look at this definition, you can immediately see the problem with it. You've got symptoms which are overlapping other conditions of the low urinary tract. And, and, but what we are trying to do here is they're trying to bring together the symptoms which will correlate with the, the function of the true under activity and the cause, underlying cause of the impaired contractility. And that is quite difficult, which kind of reminds me of this quote from um, Alice in Wonderland, where Alice said, the question is whether you can make words mean so many different things. And Humpty Dumpty then said, the question is, which is to be master, that's all. And what that means really to me is that uh, we have to get this right. We have to make sure it's accurate and, and we need to know what the definition would be that would uh, be applicable to clinical practice as well as to research. And at the moment, this is a very difficult problem, as you will see. So what are the symptoms? The symptoms of the underactive bladder are quite mixed. You've got storage symptoms, voiding symptoms, and post maturation symptoms all together. If you look at this very large urodynamic uh, series from Korea of over, well, almost uh, 1,200 patients over the age of 65, this showed significant overlap between detrusor sound activity and other lower urinary tract dysfunctions. In fact, almost 47% of males with underactivity also had overactivity and blood outlet obstruction. And 70, almost 73% of women with underactivity also had overactivity and also had stress incontinence. So you can see the problem straight away. Now, if you then look at other papers and studies that have addressed this. This was a, a, another series of urodynamic observations um, and, and the symptoms uh, from those studies from a large database in Bristol. Now, this looked at over, well, nearly 1,800 adults from a pressure flow study database, and they divided into truce under activity without bladder outlet obstruction, 
blood outlet obstruction without the true sandra activity, and normal pressure flow studies. And what they found was that patients with detrusa underactivity reported significantly higher in occurrence of decreased or interrupted stream, hesitancy, feeling of incomplete emptying, a palpable bladder, and absent or decreased sensation compared to patients who had normal pressure flow studies. So that is sort of getting there. It's starting, we're starting to get a feel for what what might be uh, the, the, the group of symptoms associated with it, or are we? Well, if you look at the same paper, look at the table that was published there, you can see that the distinction between detrusa underactivity and bladder outlet obstruction is going to be quite difficult based on symptoms. Now, the urinary stream is decreased in 56% of underactive bladders and 82% uh, of obstructed bladders. Hesitancy, the figures are 51%, 69%. Feeling of incomplete emptying is only in 36% of detrusa underactivity, 29% in obstruction, and strangely, 22% of normal people. And similarly, if you look at what you think should be a common symptom of absent or decreased sensation, was only pre present in 13% of detrusa underactivity group. But also very interestingly, you can see that urgency was present in 30% of people with the underactive bladder. Now this has also been shown in another series from, um, uh, from Australia, from Melbourne, which uh, found a prevalence of detrusa underactivity of 23%. And this was a group of uh, patients um, you know, the average age of about 60 and, and uh, about 68% were women. And of these, 40% had pelvic surgery previously and back surgery in about 20%. Now in that group, they found that urgency was present in 63%. Now that is quite a large amount, it's more than half. There was, there's been another recent publication which has addressed this and, and this has looked at the patient experience of the underactive bladder. So what do patients say and, and how do they report this? And, and again, this has come from Bristol, um, relatively small number, but it's working towards a, 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 a sort of a qualitative um, assessment of what is thought to be the underactive bladder. But again, if you look at this, this, um, uh, this table, um, shows that storage symptoms like urgency and frequency are pretty common for almost half of, the, of all the people who had detrusa um, under activity. And therefore, I think what, what we have to derive from it, that at the moment, these symptoms can only be suggestive of a specific urogenomic abnormality, but they are not specific for a particular condition. And here lies our first problem. Now, let's go on to um, the etiology and the pathogenesis. To understand this, let's go back to basics. Now, this, the switch between the storage and the voiding phases of the micturition cycle involves coordination between the bladder and its outlet. There's an, an inverse and coordinated action where the bladder contracts and the, the outlet will, will relax and, and, uh, and vice versa. And this switching is mediated by a complex neurophysiological and behavioral mechanisms. Um, which includes higher, higher central nervous system mechanisms. Now, when you talk about impaired contractility, the contractility itself is a, is a measure of muscle response. So, so if you think about the, the previous slide, now it's a muscle response downstream of neurotransmitter stimulation. In other words, there has to be all the upper tracks, you know, with, in terms of the, the, the nervous control and the coordination, um, all that has to be intact. And it's only after that, the downstream response, the muscle response is what is contractility. So when we talk about impaired contractility, that in itself may not explain the true sound reactivity because the true sound reactivity is of course, as I keep saying, and I apologize for repeating myself, it's a urodynamic finding. So it's only a urodynamic finding, it's not a condition. And, but, and this may be, this, this 
this may be a result of this impairment of the contractility and that impairment may be because of an impairment of neural stimulation or perhaps insensitivity to normal neural stimulation, perhaps impaired intracellular signaling, damaged contractile machinery, or perhaps abnormal biomechanics of the passive elements that constitute the, the bladder. So apart from the, the contractile elements. So, so there's lots of things here that has to be taken into account. And, and as this uh, lovely diagram shows, these, this, table, this, this, these, this condition can be caused by a dysfunction at various levels by various different conditions. For example, it may be the brain circuits that are affected or efferent pathways. It could be the afferent pathways or the sensory pathways and the detrusor muscle itself or the muscle and the extracellular matrix. Now, these can be caused by various etiological factors, which include aging, blood outlet obstruction, diabetes mellitus, and neurological conditions. And, and as you can see from the, the boxes on the right, there are different ways where we think that this might affect the detrusor function. Now let's look at a few of these. Detrusor underactivity has an age-related prevalence. We know that from the Eurodynamic databases. And we know that there's loss of bladder performance and voiding efficiency with age. However, not everyone gets detrusor underactivity as they age. And also, um, we know that um, age-related degradation of contractility has not been conclusively demonstrated. There are uh, several animal studies and studies uh, uh, on human tissue, which are lab-based, which have shown that degradation of contractility has, 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 is not something that happens all the time. And it, in fact, it probably is preserved. There's been studies on looking at human biopsy samples under the, uh, look, looked under the electron microscope, and the morphological changes that have been seen on them are not uh, correlated with age. However, what has been noticed is that there is a decline in sensory function in the low urinary tract with aging. So I think the jury is out. It contributes, um, you know, aging certainly contributes to it. It may be a contributing factor and it's very important. It's correlated with it, but it's not clear that it's a causative um, effect. What about bladder outlet obstruction? This is again a potential contributing factor, but remember, the true sound reactivity is common both in men and in women as we age. But blood outlet obstruction is only common in older men, but not in women. So that correlation is weak there itself. But apart from that, not all men with blood outlet obstruction get the true cell underactivity. And furthermore, there's been, um, you know, as this study from, from Bristol again showed that detrusor contractility does not decline in patients with long-term untreated blood outlet obstruction. So, so these, again, urodynamics demonstrated that um, outlet obstruction, if, even if it's untreated, does not actually affect detrusor contractility. Um, I think that, that data was over 10 or 11 years. What about neurological disorders? Now, this detrusor underactivity is a common neurodynamic finding in various neurogenic bladder dysfunctions, which includes multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, cerebrovascular accidents or strokes, and certain types of spinal cord injury. Now, detrusor underactivity is found in 36% of dominant-sided uh, strokes, but if it's bilateral stroke, it's about 40%. There's also the true sound reactivity found in peripheral autonomic denervation from pelvic surgery, surgery such as radical hysterectomies and radical pelvic cancer surgery, such as exenterations. There's also a high prevalence in diabetics. And in this group, we know that, that it occurs later in the course of um, the disease and, and that the true sound reactivity um, is, is more common if the diabetes is poorly controlled which suggests that this may be because of uh, peripheral neuropathy. Fowler's syndrome is, has often been discussed in this, in, in this context, but, but remember, Fowler's syndrome is uh, a condition where there's urethral sphincter overactivity rather than detrusor dysfunction.
So how do we diagnose this? I, I, I can, I'm sure a lot of you are getting confused here now thinking, well, we don't have a good you know, group of symptoms to identify the condition. Uh, flow tests are non-specific, as you talked about, you know, the, the overlap between obstructed and unobstructed uh, uh, men. Um, Post-foid residuals may be associated with either detrusive underactivity or bladder outlet obstruction, and, and there's no standard test. So, so it is indeed a very difficult diagnosis to make, and we are still reliant on pressure flow studies and computer-generated algorithms for this. This is an invasive test, as you know, it involves introduction of uh, uh, pressure catheters, monitoring catheters, and therefore, therefore it, it is not something that can be used in the community uh, or in an outpatient clinic, um, and it certainly requires a degree of urodynamic expertise. Now, if we look at this trace, um, now you'll see that, it, as this is a standard trace, and if I can use my uh, pointer, um, you've got the abdominal pressure tracing there and the vesicle line or the bladder line in blue and, and the subtracted line denotes the detrusor pressure or the subtracted detrusor pressure, which is PDET. And in the voiding phase or the pressure flow study phase, there is hardly any detrusor activity seen. And, and the mechanism of this is through abdominal straining. So this person is actually voiding through uh, abdominal straining and, and um, with almost no detrusive activity. This is a person with an underlying neurogenic etiology, and in fact, uh, he voided over a liter with almost complete bladder emptying. So, so you can see, with, if you looked at this person's other parameters, you would find that they, 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 their flow might have been good, their post void residual might have been quite, quite uh, low, if not zero. In a different situation, you would see that there is some detrusor activity, but it's quite low and it's not of a high amplitude. So we use a parameter called PDET Qmax, which is the detrusor pressure at maximum flow. So the detrusor pressure maximum flow of 35 in this case, but here again, there is, there is use of abdominal pressure and straining or abdominal effort to void it's a poor flow rate of only seven mils per second. This person voided about 100 mils and had a residual of 470 mils. Now, to understand how this diagnosis is made, you need to know that most measures of detrusive function use two parameters to estimate the strength. Now, that looks as, at the Qmax, which is the maximum flow, and you look at the, the detrusive pressure, the subtracted detrusive pressure, at Qmax or maximum flow. Now, what they, we don't use in most of the parameters is, is the speed of the contraction or the sustenance, the sustenance or the, the, the uh, reliability of that contraction. To understand how this is worked out, you need to go back to the basics of what is called the bladder output relation. Now, this was described by Derek Griffiths back in the 90s. And, and if you plot the flow rate against the detrusive pressure on the y-axis, then you can see that there are two fundamental situations. You can either get a high flow with a low PDET, and that is unobstructed, whereas you can also get, on the other end of the spectrum, you can get a high PDET with a low flow and that is considered obstructed. Now, if the detrusive contraction, on the other hand, becomes weaker, now what we looked at in the trace above was a normal contraction, but if the detrusive contraction becomes weaker, then this bladder output relation of BOR moves down. And, 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 and then in that case, you would find that there'll be lower flow rates and lower pressures in that relationship. And this relationship is a basis for various measures for bladder contractility index, the Watts factor, and, and the, the Lin per. Now, this is a table that is uh, from Campbell's urology. And as you can see, that, that there are different ways that we use uh, urodynamic measurements um, in, in diagnosing detrusor underactivity. And these could be mathematical calculations, indices, 
can use occlusion, occlusion uh, testing to get um, isovolumetric contraction strength, or you could use a range of various normal or normative urodynamic uh, measurements. But of course, there is no widely accepted normal range, which makes that difficult. But if you go back to the major uh, urodynamic studies that have been published, you can see that uh, most of them have used various parameters for a, a diminished flow rate and, and uh, PDET Qmax. But um, certain, other, uh, certain uh, studies have also looked at specific parameters such as the uh, bladder outlet index um, uh, and in, in combination with a with a, with a poor flow rate. So if someone is unobstructed in that situation with a poor flow rate, that has been considered to be indicative of detrusive underactivity. Whereas there are uh, other measurements such as the bladder contractility index, which demonstrates weak contractility. So what is a Watts factor? That is something that has been mentioned. It comes up from time to time in discussions. It's a measure of contraction strength, and it, it refers to the power per unit of bladder area. But it is a difficult calculation. It's very difficult to understand if you look at it there. Um, and, and this, because of the complexity, it is usually integrated into the computer software that gives us the Eurodynamics report. Now, I only find this useful when it's able to show a, a, a trace as a continuous measure, because that sometimes shows us how the contractility tails off and, and that poor you know, sustainability of the, of the contraction is something that can be shown by a plot if that's available, but a lot of machines don't show that. And again, the problem here is there's no validated cutoff. What is more useful and popular in, in urodynamic circles is the use of the bladder contractility index. This is something that I use, and, and um, it's, it's, uh, it, it again has the same, same equation uh, comparing the detrusor of PDET Qmax uh, versus the Qmax. And, and the formula is quite easy to calculate. It's PDET Qmax plus 5 Qmax and a bladder contractility index of less than 100 is indicative of a weak contraction. The other way is also to look at the bladder outlet obstruction index, or the buoy as we call it, which is PDECT Qmax minus 2 Qmax, and, and if that is less than 20, then it's unobstructed. So, so if you have someone who's unobstructed with a poor flow rate, uh, with or without a, a significant residual volume, uh, post void that may be suggestive of the true sound activity. The problem with all this is that these were these algorithms were originally designed for adult men, most of them with with uh, prostatic obstruction, and they have not been validated for women. And when you compare one with the other, we don't know if they all describe bladder power equally or if the results are interchangeable. So if you use one parameter and you have another one and they don't agree with each other we're not entirely sure if they are, you know, which, which, ones, which one would hold out. Um, so there's more research that needs to be done. And particularly, we need to know what are the threshold values for defining detrusa under activity when you apply it to the, the definition that is currently um, the, the working definition. Um, there's also some debate about whether urodynamics is reliable in terms of the artificial circumstances. And in fact, one study reported that when there was a contractile bladders, which means no contraction visible at all on office urodynamics, and then they went on to have ambulatory studies, 84% of these people had some detrusa activity, so they were not completely a contractile. So management, the goals of management of this are to improve symptoms and quality of life, and perhaps importantly, to identify where interventions may not be appropriate. For example, if you're talking about bladder outlet surgery, such as a TORP, uh, you may wish to look at the data on the long-term outcomes and see if, if other options would, be be would serve the patient better um, if, if we know that a TORP may not work. But at the moment, there are no ideal solutions as yet, and that is, again, a problem. Now, what are the management strategies? Now, we can look at it in different ways. We can, we can either try and increase the bladder contractility. We can decrease the outlet resistance 
or we can bypass it completely and, and use some form of drainage or do nothing, uh, which is important. And furthermore, you can also deal with complications, which are such as like uh, treatment of urinary tract infections and bladder stones. Now, this data from uh, Melbourne looked at what's commonly uh, offered to these patients, and we found that uh, they reported that the majority are ISC alone or intermittent self catheterization, and, and, uh, which is over half, and then about a quarter of them have observation alone. So th these two in, in combination um, comprise of uh, three fourths of all the management options that we have. But let's start with do nothing, observation. And, and I think with regard to this, if you look at this paper from Bristol, which looked at uh, 224 men who were diagnosed with detrusor underactivity, 69 of them opted for conservative management, out of which 84% or 58 remained untreated. And these were followed up for a mean of 13.6 years. And what was shown is that there was no significant, uh, significant change in symptoms, no worsening of chronic retention, and, and uh, the remaining who did not stay on conservative management um, went on to have TRP for retention or progressive symptoms. So in, in the 84%, which is the 58, there was no change, which is interesting to know. But if there is a substantial post void residual and if this is causing symptoms with post maturation, you know, sensation of incomplete emptying, for example, then intermittent catheterization is a very good option if they're able to do so. And obviously that requires uh, an ability to do so in terms of hand function, you know, whether they can oppose their finger and thumb, whether they have coordination, whether they can access the urethra, um, may not be possible for a person in a wheelchair, particularly a female in a wheelchair, or if, there's, if someone is obese, or they may not have the mental capacity or the cognitive um, function to be able to do so. Um, we know that it is safe and very well accepted and, and if, if taught properly. But if it's not possible because of unfavorable body habitus, poor hand function, or any of these other things that I mentioned, then in that case, a long-term suprapubic catheter may be an option to consider. What about behavioral therapies and physiotherapy? Um, in individuals with reduced sensation of bladder filling, uh, it may be worth helping them to uh, void on a timed basis and perhaps double void. And this double voiding is based on the idea of optimal bladder capacity, which means what, what that suggests is that the bladder has an optimal capacity at which it contracts better. So, so if, you, if you void twice, then you're more likely to be able to uh, empty the bladder better or more effectively. Uh, there's also valsalva or reflex voiding that has been described and that's, that's possible as long as the pressures in the bladder remain low. Um, there's pelvic floor relaxation therapies which physiotherapists offer and biofeedback, which are also very useful modalities. What about pharmacological therapies, the drugs to improve contractility? Now, the bottom line is that none are used in practice because none of them are effective. Now, what has been tried are parasympathomimetics, which is like a bethanicol, which is a muscarinic receptor agonist, and there's a cholinesterase inhibitor, which is diastigmine. Now, Neither of these have been shown to have a good efficacy, and in fact, they are poorly tolerated with abdominal cramping, flushing, bronchospasm, and visual disturbances. Prostaglandin E has been used in the past as well, but I'll come back to that in a, in a minute, um, because that has, is not available in clinical practice. What else can we do to improve contractility? We can try uh, the sacral root stimulation, which is a Brindley device, um, some of you may know about this. This is a sacral anterior root stimulator. Um, there's intravascular electrotherapy that has been used. Uh, there's data on children in particular. Sacral neuromodulation is something that has been uh, has shown to have good uh, outcomes in women with retention, tibial nerve stimulation. Um, and, and what's interesting is, is this option of latissimus dorsi to trusa myoplasty. Now, this is something that can be that is that has been explored to look at um, look at 
um, bladders that cannot be stimulated. So you've got electrical stimulation, the first um, five options that I've listed on this slide. And, but if you cannot stimulate them, then the latissimus dorsi is, is something that can be used as, as um, uh, and, and a voluntary means of, of using a, a striated muscle to contract the bladder or to help empty the bladder. Now, there's, there's this paper that's quoted from 2011, from, uh, uh, it shows a case series of uh, 24 patients with a contractile detrusor. Um, 17 of these recovered the ability to void and, and they emptied their bladders quite efficiently. And the mean bladder contractility index was increased to, to um, quite quite significant degree. But a third of these patients had complications and, and um, from what I understand, this is a quite a long and complicated procedure. It requires more than one team. And, and therefore, the selection criteria for this has to be quite stringent and quite narrow. And I think it's something that cannot be used in our general practice um, when, we, when you're talking about the wide range of men and women with detrusive underactivity, particularly in the elderly population, then this cannot be really applied. So at the moment, I think this is not recommended as a routine option, but it's, it's something that is being researched and we would hopefully get more data and more evidence on this in the future. What about sacral neuromodulation? This has been uh, something that was introduced in 1982 by Tanago and Schmidt, and, and it has shown good demonstration, good, good efficacy in patients with urinary retention and detrusive underactivity. And, and again, the, the exact mechanism of sacral neuromodulation is not known, but it's thought to inhibit the afferent signals from the urethra and restore normal afferent flow to the CNS. What about reducing blood outlet of resistance? Now, alpha blockers or alpha adrenergic receptor antagonists are often used, but they're off, it's an off-license use for this indication. Um, various other um, medications have been used, uh, including botulinum toxin to the urethral sphincter, and of course, surgery such as uh, TURP or external sphincterotomy or even a prostatic mesh have been used to reduce the resistance to the outflow. Um, and as I've uh, said earlier, that these are all um, based on the idea that if, if there's reduced contractility, then by, by reducing the resistance, you'd help to empty the bladder better. However, the long-term symptomatic outcomes are no better. And this is, again, the same slide that I've shown you before, uh, just to remind you on the data behind uh, the natural history of what happens with uh, detrusa underactivity after TURP with a minimum 10-year follow-up. There's no sustained reduction in symptoms, no improvement in flow rates, and a higher incidence of retention. Tamsulosin, um, it's had some beneficial effects in only about a third of, uh, of women with detrusive underactivity in terms of voiding scores and post-void residuals. Um, and this is why it's, 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 it's commonly used, but, but the evidence is not strong. There was one study which looked at a uh, combination of, of an alpha blocker with a parasympathetic mimetic drug. And, and uh, again, that reported improved flow rates and reduced post void residuals. Um, however, the evidence for all this is not strong. There are no randomized trials. Uh, these are usually case series and, and uh, the recommendations are, are pretty weak. We can't really recommend any, uh, using any of these options. And, and um, as this uh, table from Campbell's urology shows that there are a lot of options which are used in routine clinical use, and some of these are experimental and some are definitely not recommended. But, but, um, but the evidence for even the ones which are in, clinical, in routine clinical use is quite weak. So what can we look forward to? This is sounding very gloomy that we don't seem to have many options at all. But what's in the horizon uh, is that the use of intravesical prostaglandin um, was reported first, I think, back in 1980. So this is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's been tried a long time ago. At that time, there was, there was a, there was, you know, reported um, a good clinical response. 
However, there, there, uh, there's a lack of randomized trials. There's not enough evidence on, on as yet. And the, the evidence of this is, is growing. Um, there's, uh, there are various other uh, different pathways that are being looked at, such as the bomb basin receptor agonists, the TRP channel activators, um, there's, there's uh, the, uh, the TRP agonists, uh, the 5-HT, uh, and also smooth muscle cell transplants and gene therapy. So in summary, coming to the end of this talk, what did we get from all this? What we know is that the definition of detrusive underactivity and the underactive bladder are evolving and, and uh, not yet imperfect. Uh, they are imperfect and not yet perfect. Um, it's not as yet possible to diagnose the condition by non-invasive means, and we are reliant on pressure flow studies. The prevalence increases with age, but detrusive dysfunction is not a process of aging itself. There are several possible pathophysiological associations, but we don't know what exactly causes the true sound reactivity. And there are no effective treatments that correct the underlying problem. However, there are several potential treatment strategies in the pipeline. Thank you very much. Any questions? Right, now, did you have any case of detrusive underactivity in children and how does this differ regarding the treatment and diagnosis? Um, yes, uh, of course, children, detrusive underactivity in children, there are several case series which have been reported and, and, uh, and, and um, in fact, the, some of the data that I showed you on treatment options have been on children. Um, the diagnosis is through urodynamics. Uh, urodynamics in children is, a, is, is, is done by a very specialized team. Uh, you have to obviously be very sensitive and very uh, careful in the way it's done. Um, and, and it, it, you know, but we find that you know, when children have urodynamics, you know, they do understand, as long as they understand what's going on, then certainly they allow a urodynamic test to be performed. Once you've confirmed your true sound reactivity, um, an option such as, um, um, such as uh, self catheterization is very much a, an option that is applicable to children as well. Okay. Someone has asked, why a patient with detrusa underactivity and TURP had high incidence of retention compared with those with detrusa underactivity and no TURP? I think the, the answer to that is that the cause of the retention is not obstruction in that case, and that's why. I think we try to, we don't really understand what causes urinary retention, because if you think about it, some men go into retention with small prostates and some men with very large prostates do not go into retention. So it's not so much the size of the prostate or the degree of obstruction. Um, although obstruction and the size is correlated, it's not always perfectly related. It's not a causative um, event. And, and a significant proportion of uh, urinary retentions may arise from detrusa underactivity. And, and I think that is, that is what we are talking about. Um, the next question is that, can the patient with high pressure chronic retention actually have underactive bladder? Um, yes, I think so. I think so. I think what happens here is that there are, the, we don't understand this condition and, and you probably know as well as I do that we don't know, you know, what makes a retention, um, you know, uh, low pressure versus a high pressure, what causes the changes in the upper tracts, you know, what, what affects the renal function. Um, a lot of different ideas have been put forward, but one of the things is that that in in certain individuals there is a change in the the, the matrix and the surrounding tissue um, around the contractile elements that leads to high pressure chronic retention. So it affects the contractility in a different way, and that possibly is the explanation for that. But yes, of course, it can can occur. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, yes. Uh, how can we deal with a woman with stress incontinence and bladder underactivity with PVRU? Uh, okay. Post with uh, post voiding residual. I think I think someone with stress incontinence and underactivity has to be counselled very carefully, and and um, you have to um, think about what options are are. Uh, likely to include, in, improve the stress incontinence, 
but not worse and avoiding dysfunction. That's why um, that's actually a really important question because counseling is really important in that situation. And, and I would certainly, you know, try alternative measures first. You know, if someone's got a high, if, if this woman has a high post void residual, then I would try teaching her self catheterization first because by getting rid of the post void residual, um, you might find that her stress incontinence has been cured or, or helped to a much greater degree. And, and that in combination with conservative options such as pelvic floor exercises and perhaps uh, bulking agents might be an option as well, might, might be an option where, where you would avoid giving this person worsening, voiding dysfunction. We don't know the answer to these um, definitively, but that's the approach I would take. I would take a more conservative approach to that. If you choose not to intervene in detrusive sound activity without bladder outlet obstruction setting, how often do you follow up patients? What might prompt intervention during follow up? Um, if there is no bladder outlet obstruction and there's detrusive sound activity, um, then then the strategy has has got to be based on whether they have sensations and whether there's a residual volume that is significant. So in other words, if there is a residual volume and the person has a feeling of incomplete emptying, then trying to reduce the residual volume might be an option. And in that situation, you would either teach that person self-catheterization or perhaps after detailed counseling, offer them bladder outlet surgery or an alpha blocker to begin with because they need to know that bladder outlet surgery may not help all their symptoms in the long term. Uh, in the short term, there's data that suggests that uh, prostatectomy of various kinds, uh, there's a couple of papers on laser prostatectomy where they say it's, it, it, it has good results, uh, even with true sound reactivity. But that situation, it's kind of, um, it's, it's a short term result that they're talking about. There's, uh, there's a good question here saying, do you recommend routine urodynamics for patients undergoing TRP to detect detrusor uh, underactivity. Um, we can't recommend that as yet, and I would advise you to look at the the, um, uh, the, the recommendations of the EAU guidelines on non-neurogenic LUTs. And in fact, um, I had a question earlier which which well, which was on that, and and um, um, the recommendations is that if if men are young um, with avoiding symptoms uh, under the age of 50, or if they're elderly over the age of 80. Any man who's had previous unsuccessful surgery or other invasive procedures, people who've had, got high post void residuals and, and the cutoff there is 300 mils. Um, so if men have had previous pelvic surgery, such as, uh, you know, radio, about, uh, colorectal resections or, 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 or radiotherapy, in that situation, um, you know, urodynamics would be very useful to try and determine um, which ones have got detrusive underactivity, overactivity, or blood outlet obstruction, but but if you um, if you if you um, um, if you if you think that that um, uh, if it's a standard person who you know a, a person who doesn't fall into any of these groups, I think the answer is is still not known, and there is a trial ongoing at the moment to look at that. Okay, um, I think we've got a we've got time for a couple more questions. Um, so. Um, Right, so the next one is, is there a cutoff value for post void residual to sustain DOA? Well, the value that's been used in the various trials and data the reports have been, have been 300 mils, and that, that is what, what is used in, in our practice. Oh, someone's asked, can you describe a neurodynamic evaluation with underactivity and overactivity? Because I've never seen such a finding. Uh, yes, it does happen, actually, and it's, it's quite interesting. And it's, it's because you, you can get someone with, with, uh, with overactive symptoms or, or, well, as you know, you can get a spread of symptoms which overlap each other. But you've got to understand that detrusor overactivity is seen in the storage phase or the fill phase of urodynamics. And then the underactivity is something that you see in the voiding phase. So yes, of course you can get both. You can get overactivity when you're filling the bladder and then during the voiding phase, you can detect underactivity by applying various indices or, or you know, or, or particularly in women, sometimes you get Valsalva voiders, for example, and they, they void without any detrusor activity 
but during the fill phase, they have overactivity. So yes, you can you can get that. Um, someone's asked, what is a bashful voider? Um, the bashful voider is some is a different condition. That is someone who has a, a voluntary sorry, I think it's involuntary difficulty in being able to uh, pass urine in a public place. And often they cannot go to public toilets. And when they're asked to, to void in, in, um, in, in, um, in a urodynamic clinic setting, they are unable to, to void. And that is different from detrusa underactivity. Perhaps one last one. Again, on self-catheterization and post void residual, um, uh, the, the, this question is that... Um, in patients with a big PVR, larger than 150 to 200 mils, is intermittent catheterization mandatory? Well, it's, nothing is mandatory because it's at the end of the day, it's a clinical decision. You have to make that in conjunction with the patient. You have to ask the patient what the symptoms are, then evaluate what you're seeing on neurodynamics, what your observations are, and then see if correction of that observation will improve the symptoms. So if there is a significant feeling of incomplete emptying, or if that person is suffering from recurrent urinary tract infections, then in that situation, teaching them self-catheterization would be a good idea. But it's never mandatory. It all depends on, on different ways of, of approaching a condition that, as you, as you know from my talk now, we actually understand it very poorly. And that's why this talk was called The Story So Far, because we only know so much, which is pretty much in the dark ages. We are very early on in our knowledge, and, and, and this will improve in the coming years. And I'm sure if you look out for it, you'll find a lot of publications will be, will be coming out on this topic in due course. I think we've reached the end of our uh, webinar. So uh, on behalf of the European School of Urology, I really want to thank you all for, uh, for joining in uh, and, and uh, listening to me. It's been a real privilege and honor to talk to you. And, and Great pleasure to, to interact and, and answer some of the questions. I hope you have found this helpful. Thank you.